Hi, I'm uh, Paul McNamara. You're um, listening to the um, online version of a uh, lecture. I divided the uh, week 10 lectures into three bits and the first bit um, that we're doing now is about nursing the person uh, with a mental health problem in the community. Um, I'm assuming by the time you're watching that this you've already uh, become aware that I'm happy for you to uh, share any information from this lecture with others um, on uh, using social media. Um, I just ask that you use the subject hashtag, um, the core subject hashtag NS3360 as a way that we can share it with each other too. If you wanted to sh um, share something directly with me or, or um, uh, connect with me on Twitter, um, I've got my Twitter address down there. Um, just want to acknowledge the last couple of uh, subject coordinators for the mental health subject, both uh, Tanya Park, who's working over in uh, Canada now, and Elizabeth uh, Manuel, who's gone down to Southern Cross Uni down in northern New South Wales. Also want to acknowledge the elders past and present on uh, whose land I'm broadcasting from today, up here in Cairns. And, uh, and just want to um, also acknowledge the people who have mentored me over the years since um, I started nursing back in 1988 and uh, a lot of the wisdom and knowledge that um, I've encountered through them is included in, in the everyday stuff. The learning outcomes are um, uh, in your workbook so I won't labour over these but basically um, what we're trying to cover today is some stuff about um, the role of the community mental health nurse and therapeutic relationships and what a community mental health services look like and um, an impact of having mental health legislation in the community. Um, I've, the, there is another um, learning outcome around self-care, but I'm not doing that in this session. I'm doing that in a uh, separate standalone presentation, which I'll, uh, I'll uh, tape next. So today's presentation is going to cover these subjects, which uh, have got a pretty close alignment to um, those learning outcomes that we were just looking at. And I'll get started with that top one there, the uh, context of community mental health care. So you might recall this slide from um, our very first lecture in, on um, day one, and and just a reminder that um, back in the you know between the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, people with uh, psychiatric disorders um, were were squirrelled away in 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 lunatic asylums. An asylum meaning initially, I think, a place of safety, but they, they turned into pretty uh, kind of nasty places. In the 1950s, chlorpromazine um, was discovered in the treatment of mental um, illness, and that made a real big difference to people, and some of those um, old institutions uh, were able to kind of empty out a little bit. And then during the 1960s, right through to the 1990s, that became actually not just a side effect of medication, but a really intentional, a really deliberate thing, uh, with the concepts around deinstitutionalization. really hard to say. and. Um, and the whole idea there was about mainstreaming mental health care uh, to work along beside general uh, health care. And so mental health units moved away from um, having been their standalone hospitals, you know, often tucked away out of sight from people, and actually just being another ward in the hospital. A lot of that was around uh, driven um, by human rights stuff. There was a, a thing that came out in the early 90s called the Burdekin Report, and for those of you old enough to uh, have um, uh, been watching newspapers and, and, and uh, you know, current affairs shows at the time, it, it might ring a bell with you. Um, this uh, Burdekin, not the place, a, a bloke, he was a human rights commissioner, and he drew attention to the human rights issues for mental health clients. Um, and the impact of mental illness on the community. And it was really influential in, in raising the awareness of the many injustices and, and problems that were experienced by people with mental illness. Um, part and parcel of, um, of that, that all fed into the whole idea of uh, deinstitutionalisation. I kind of don't know why I'm tripping over that word this afternoon, but anyway, I am. Um, this is a picture of uh, Wolston Park Hospital, um, which is the um, big mental health institution just outside of Brisbane and on Wakehall on, on the way up to Ipswich. Nowadays it's been renamed as the Park the Centre of Mental Health um, Excellence but, and, and I think it's had quite a few names over the years um, starting off with a, a, one of those names um, denoting it as, as a, a lunatic asylum I think. Um, but anyway look it's had many different names and it's still were a big facility but once upon a time not all that many years ago it had hundreds of beds and um, now that's been downsized considerably. 
that all kind of feeds into what was coming out of that stuff around the Burdick and report around deinstitutionalisation and around that mainstream care and the most recent um, mental health uh, plan for Queensland is uh, this one here, the one that runs from 2007-2017 uh, and as you can probably see clearly there um, on the screen is that it's got these six principles um, around consumer and carer participation so they're no longer just passive recipients of care, that they actually participate in their care making decisions um, where there's a focus around um, both resilience, like so uh, you become uh, better capable of uh, managing life stresses, and recovery. Oh, um, the recovery model, I won't go into detail here, it gets covered in a different lecture with a, a little bit more detail, but the recovery model is more around, um, I guess, saying I, I won't I won't sit here and wait for the experts to cure me, I'll participate in, in making myself um, uh, move towards recovery and not necessarily cure as in get rid of all the symptoms but just move in that direction it's more about I'll, I'll, I'll notice my strengths and I'll notice what my uh, quality of life what my my aspirations are and that's what will actually guide my care other principles around social inclusion so is it quite the reverse of what I was talking about earlier on um, instead of having people squirreled away from society include them in society the collaboration and partnerships is between uh, not just the clients or sorry consumers and carers and the clinicians but but also between um, the when the clinicians who are working with the consumers and carers that they collaborate um, also with other agencies and form partnerships with other agencies I'll give, get on to examples about that um, in a little while um, there's also some principles around promotion uh, prevention and early intervention. I'll be honest with you, I think that's kind of fallen off the radar a bit over the last couple of years, um, and um, but something that does remain um, um, embedded in the uh, state government um, uh, Queensland Mental Health Plan is that our intervention should be evidence-based. So that's where we're coming from now. Throughout this diagram, because I want to give a bit of an idea of, of how um, the it really works for the person is that if we put the person or the consumer at the at the, the priority um, position in the in the picture, and that's where I've got them there, that that top layer, and around them supporting them, hopefully so they've still got some carers. That'll be family or friends or uh, maybe workmates or you know neighbours or whatever. But, but hopefully that person's got a, a support platform there, and that's a really useful thing. Sometimes I think we traditionally might have overlook those people but they're, they're really important they're probably the most important people in that person's life next layer out is in the primary care sector so if you've got a decent GP um, and you're experiencing any sort of illness but uh, including with a uh, mental health problem um, it's really really valuable to have a great GP there's NGOs about the place places uh, I'll, I'll name a few more of these in a moment but people like um, uh, the the uh, mental health fellowship um, uh, foundation, um, who are non-government organisation, who actually uh, bring people together and and provide them with a, a bit of a social outlet. Uh, there's other agencies too. Uh, you know, the Department of Housing and and Centrelink plays a big part in uh, supporting some people who have got um, uh, long-standing and and um, and uh, enduring mental health problems. Now the next layer, which is kind of getting on to where, where I come from, I guess, work-wise. And then there's the community mental health layer. And we're going to go into a bit more detail about that. But I just want to, I guess, using this diagram, just reinforce that there is this layer that goes from the person, then the carers, then the GPs, and then there's community mental health. And really, in mental health, inpatient care is... like pretty much like the care of the last resort that's not what we're aiming for I think um, mental health probably more so than the other specialties in the health really focuses on trying to keep people um, well enough to stay out of hospital just going back to what I was talking about there before with the um, uh, GPs and NGOs so hopefully um, so here hopefully this uh, 
um, shows up okay on your screen. But there's a sign for a GP clinic, um, and that's that's really important. But also, I guess at that layer of care are other things um, like Centrelink here, like the Department of Housing, um, the Medicare locals. They um, they provide a thing called ATAPS, uh, which is uh, access to allied access to allied psychological services that's what it stands for and um, and that's where a uh, people can with the benefit of a uh, referral from a GP can have a few sessions with uh, you know say a psychologist or a, or a credentialed mental health nurse or maybe a social worker or what have you and won't be out of pocket for that so we'll be getting that in the private system but it'll be essentially getting bulk billed as far as the patient's concerned the, the mechanism's a little bit different to bulk billing but anyway, at, at the patient's end they're not paying for it so it makes it nice and affordable and accessible um, the other one here I've got the partners in in recovery and that's something that's actually funded by the Medicare locals I think and um, and in, is embedded with the NGOs in Cairns I think Centrelink picked it up and they work um, hand in hand with uh, um, consumers who, who are experiencing enduring mental health problems and their carers and, and act as a support agency do on the grounds are often really quite practical things you know I'll come around and see you on Tuesday and we'll see how you're going with getting those forms filled in for Centrelink or um, or I might be able to help you access you know some other stuff that you're uh, that you might need and then there's other places like uh, Worklink down here and um, Worklink's uh, um, organisation that started up in um, got started up here in Cairns it must be coming up for like 18, 19 years ago now, and um, and their their initial initial brief was uh, very much about helping people with mental health problems get back into the workplace. They thought that there was um, some dignity and and some pride to be had in that. The the other one that I've got over here, this is a terrific logo. I, I um, from uh, a private practice psychiatrist um, and I, I know the psychiatrists who have that I must congratulate them on their, their fantastic logo with the, the head full of busy busy wire um, but in the in the private practice area which uh, I guess because I've been in the public sector for so long um, I sometimes overlook but there are psychiatrists um, psychologists um, mental health nurses who are working under credentialed um, working as credentialed mental health nurses, um, social workers, occupational therapists, um, some more generic counsellors who sometimes we're a little bit worried about. But there's this whole whole sector out there who are supporting people with mental health problems outside of the, the mental health thing. And then there's other things, that the public health things like Mental Health Week and Random Actors, Acts of Kindness, which also play a part in keeping people well. I'm telling you about that stuff because when you go on clinical placement, I'm assuming that not, I know that not all of you, but I, I, I do know that most of you will wind up in the uh, public sector. And I just want to make sure that you're not missing that there's these other layers of stuff going on out there. It's not just about the public sector. Now I'm going to talk to you about the public sector. This is a really busy map um, that um, I got the guys at Cairns uh, uh, and Hinterland Mental Health and ATOD service to send me. Um, I'm not sure if you can read it on the screen that you're looking at, but it just shows the structure. I guess what I really want to point out, that with all of this structure, all of this structure, each one of those yellow boxes that you see there <coughs> is one part of the, uh, the clinical response to helping out people with mental health problems. And there's only two boxes on there, that MHU there and the Annex slash Lakeside Clinic, which actually are inpatients. All the rest of it's happening uh, out in the community. And that's really kind of important to know. Let me show you another picture which might actually help you get your head around that. So here I've done up a little diagram of uh, Cairns Mental Health. I'm really very pleased with the way it looks. I hope you enjoy it too. Um, and I'm just going to run through with what's what there, just so you kind of get your head around what a, a public mental health sector looks like. So this is uh, Cairns and Hinterland Mental Health and, uh, and I know it's not dissimilar down in Townsville, um, they've got a few extra services. M Mackay and Mount Isa are a fair bit smaller I understand, um, 
but anyway, look, I'll stop rambling and I'll just get on with it. Let's start with those red ones. Those those three red points there, they're kind of uh, the primary access points of where um, uh, consumers um, access the mental health service. So the first one there at the top is uh, ACT, the acute care team, and they um, they can do home visits or you can do a walk-in appointment with them or make an appointment with them. GPs can refer to the acute care team. So as far as mental health is concerned, the acute care team is kind of like the front door to the service. Um, in recent years they've spun off and, and have actually put a few of their, their clinicians down in uh, the emergency department at Cairns Hospital, the, the public hospital here. and. Um, and that's just as a matter of convenience. So I, I guess those two team, team, well it's one team, but those two components of the service um, would probably account for, I'm just making stuff up here, but probably 80, 90% of all new referrals would come through those front doors. Um, I think in the ideal world there, there would only be one referral point, but on a practical level it doesn't kind of work out that way. But anyway, the acute care teams come up with yeah, by far and away the majority of, of the new referrals. They'll make the assessments and sort out where to go from there. The other one that we've got in there in red is the team that I'll be returning to in, in July, the Consultation Liaison Psychiatric Service. What does all that bucket load of uh, syllables mean? That, that means uh, it's a service that provides mental health services uh, in the general hospital. Think of it as of general hospital mental health. So we go to every ward in the hospital except for the mental health unit. When you're physically unwell, um, you're more vulnerable to developing mental health problems. And the reverse is true too. If you've got a, um, you know, a enduring and, 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 um, and serious mental health problems, you're much more liable to get uh, physical illnesses. So we, we hopefully support um, those uh, consumers, those hospital patients, and also of course the uh, clinicians looking after them, the, the doctors, nurses, physios, what have you, who are providing care to uh, those people. So they're, they're the main access points. There are a few others, but I'll get to them um, in due time. Then I've divided up into uh, four the uh, yellow components of, of where the inpatient units are. And, and I did arm an hour about this because it kind of makes it look bigger than what it is. But, but to be fair, there, there are four distinct components to inpatient mental health care in Cairns. I think down in Townsville there's probably more than four, but my understanding is there might be six or seven different components. But look, I'll talk about what I know, and uh, and if you're going on clinical placement down in Townsville, I'm sure you'll find out more details than, um, than what I can talk about here. So there's what's called the Annex, and um, that's a 10-bed unit which is actually off-site at the moment. When the hospital redevelopment in Cairns is completed, those, hospital, those beds will come back into the hospital. But they're um, uh, the the public health services um, has uh, hired some beds out at the um, private mental health hospital here in Cairns, and so they they actually run and staffed by um, the public sector, and they, it's really useful having those ten extra beds there. They're a really nice kind of step down from the acute ward, or if somebody's you know maybe a bit frail and elderly and and wouldn't do well. Um, in the uh, acute mental health ward and haven't got needs that are so intense that they have to be in the acute mental health ward, um, we would probably look at seeing if we could get them a bed at the annex. Next one is the low dependency unit, LDU, and um, and that's got, uh, look I'm kind of guessing here, I'll say 30 beds, I'm a bit close within two or three there I think, and um, and uh, even though it's low dependency, it, it uh, you know like most of the time people who get there aren't in a great way. I would imagine probably 80, 90 percent of the people who are admitted to the low dependency unit are admitted as involuntary patients. They, um, if, le if left to their own device, would probably rather go home. Um, people who are having suicidal thoughts, maybe, or really disorganised, you know, thought disordered, might be um, having uh, some hallucinations or their delusional stuff um, taking over a bit. So they'll they'll get a bed there. Um, spa is um, special purpose area, I think, 
um, um, which is only uh, about four beds as part of the low dependency unit. But if we had somebody who was, say, frail because they were elderly or um, had an eating disorder and needed to be really closely watched around meal times and that, that they weren't purging, um, uh, maybe a, a, a um, say a, a, a teenager who was a bit elevated with their mood and was being a bit sexually promiscuous, you'd, you'd keep them in, in spa um, so you could kind of keep them safe and, and, and contained and, um, and so they wouldn't be too, too vulnerable. And then there's PICU, uh, the Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit, which is eight beds now, I think, and, um, and that's... Um, that's there for the, the people who are the most unwell in the community. And um, often those people um, you know, are really uh, losing touch with reality, having auditory hallucinations. Sometimes those auditory hallucinations will be command hallucinations. They're really unwell and they're just going through a really bad patch and they will need a period of confinement in, in the psychiatric intensive care unit. So that's a, a locked unit within within the ward. Um, it's uh, got pretty heavy staffing. Sometimes for students, um, they, they, if, if things are really unsettled in PICU, uh, just to keep students safe, they'll say, oh look, maybe, maybe not come in today, um, and they'll, they'll reallocate you elsewhere. So if they, if they do that, that's about keeping you and the, uh, themselves and the patients safe, so don't be offended if, uh, if you get um, declined from being in PICU. So they're the, they're the different components of inpatient care. So I think if we added them up as we go, I think I probably added up about 50 beds there, give or take. CCT down the bottom there in green, and I've put there by three, and I, I just realised now while I was talking about this stuff is, is that I've really sold short the, um, um, the smaller country towns, which, um, which also are part of the Cairns and Hinterland Mental Health Service. So there's actually more than three in, in effect, because um, I forgot to mention Mosman, Mareeba, Atherton, Innisfail, um, uh, Cooktown Mental Health Services, um, and the remote mental health services. God, I left them off too. So there, there are these different components, but that's where they're, they're kind of like the... Um, they, they're the workhorses, really, of the mental health service. That's where they use case management models. Um, they provide um, uh, regular care. You know, we'll be seeing uh, people you know, weekly, maybe fortnightly, if they're um, going OK, um, in their own home, doing assertive outreach and uh, helping out with medication and the day-to-day -day side of things. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about case management in a while. Uh, there's uh, MERT, which is the mobile intensive rehab team. Um, we're great on acronyms in mental health. Um, and they do, like the case management teams do, but have a much, much smaller cohort of, um, of consumers, usually uh, about half a dozen each. And so then they can, they can see those people uh, most days of the week. Um, and, and I guess that's just talking about their, their um, level of, of disability or unwellness at the time that, that they the consumers who come under the MERT team are often going through a really tough patch and uh, yeah need really strong follow-up but MERT are, by, by seeing people daily can give them the sort of care that um, usually keeps them well enough to stay out of hospital which is great. Then there's a few of the specialist teams coming around now KIMS which is Child and Youth Mental Health Service um, and they um, see from ages like zero, I think, through to 18, and, um, and they provide um, lots of uh, uh, direct support, not just to the kids, but also to the kids' families, and, and help you know, mum and dad or whoever else is, is playing a part in helping out the, the child or young person, um, helping them manage the, um, the, the symptoms and, and helping them stay on top of things. Evolve is um, uh, kind of related to child and youth mental health services, but tend to be older kids, like you know, kids who are in their their teens, and they have often um, had quite traumatic uh, stuff happen to them. Often behaviourally, um, these kids are um, in a fair bit of trouble. So that's Evolve. That's another component of the service. OPMHS stands for Older Persons Mental Health Service, which is exactly as it says. So um, uh, for the over 65s um, and, um, and they deal a lot with um, uh, 
you know, like say, you know, like depression and anxiety, though those common um, mental health disorders, and and also something that we would have touched upon in the um, um, the lecture around uh, cognitive disorders in in older people, and and we would have spoken there about uh, the behavioural and psychological symptoms of uh, dementia and often they'll go in there and help out a bit there. The Older Persons Mental Health Services uh, recently in partnership with the uh, geriatrician, one of the, or the geriatricians at the hospital has kind of got a couple of beds that they have on the on the geriatric unit which they can admit people to for assessment but that's only pretty recent, that's basically a, uh, an outpatient service, they go into people's homes or, or for those people who are in nursing homes into the nursing homes of course. Um, ATOT stands for Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Service. Um, that's um, almost entirely uh, an outpatient service. They do have a, a, um, a bit of a, a, like a day detox where people are admitted in the mornings and, and, and discharged in the afternoons. And also they do in reach a bit like um, that role that I was describing with mine where I go to the general hospital. ATOT's in reach into the general hospital too to help out with things like alcohol withdrawal and, and you know, perhaps other drug withdrawal as well. And then the other specialist unit that I included there uh, was forensic mental health. Um, they go up into the prison and um, and see people while they're actually uh, still incarcerated, and and will also support them after um, those people have been discharged from prison. So that's what a service looks like. As, as I say, down in Townsville, um, you throw in a few more rings there. You know, they've got a, a child and youth inpatient unit, a, a forensic inpatient unit. Um, a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, um, Townsville's still got a perinatal mental health service which um, uh, CAMS that was defunded about 18 months ago. So, so so it's not one size fits all but anyway look hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what a mental health service looks like. What I really want to do though is just reinforce what I was talking about before is that most of what's going on in mental health is happening outside of the hospitals. So these on any given day, there will be about 50 people, give or take, who are mental health patients or consumers who, who are inpatients. But the vast majority, because um, on any given day, we've got about two and a half thousand people open to the service, give or take, and, um, and the vast majority of people are getting their care and follow up in the community. And, um, and I guess I just really want to reinforce that because I would imagine, um, that kind of makes mental health um, you know, a little bit unusual with perhaps what you've been um, exposed to with previous um, uh, clinical placements. So yeah, so if you're, if you're working with people on an inpatient unit, they make up about 2% of the, the total. And many, many, many people who uh, come under the care of mental health services might never have a, an admission, an inpatient admission to a, the mental health unit all their care takes place in the community. Or if, it, if they do have an admission, it'll be a fairly short admission. I think the average uh, admission time for mental health is 12 days or something. And um, yeah, so it's a, it's a transient part of the thing, but most of the work is done beyond the hospital walls. Right, let's catch our breath. That's all I really want to say about the context of mental health care. And um, I kind of hope that makes uh, sense. Just want to move on now and talk a little bit, little bit about uh, therapeutic relationships and, uh, and involuntary treatment. So if we look to the definition in uh, Elders, Evans and Nazette, and you'll find this on page 524, a consumer is someone who has the lived experience of mental health, oh sorry, of mental distress and who has received care from mental health professionals. Um, I really intentionally um, threw in there crossing out those old terms with patient and client and the whole idea about um, the, that renaming of the consumer, I'd imagine you would have got from uh, Elsa Rainery in session two in the lecture. Um, hopefully that's been really clear to you, but it's a more empowering term. Um, the idea of, of patient, uh, the thought around that was that it was a bit um, passive, an expert clinician prescribes or tells the patient what to do and, and I, the patient, will just quietly wait there for your wisdom. A client, um, yeah, I, I think some people feel a little bit uncomfortable with that as a, as a, uh, uh, a descriptor because it, it didn't really spell out 
a, a, a sharing of power where the idea of consumer is, I think, around an empowered consumer, I think Choice Magazine, um, is that they play a part in what's going on. Someone who has a lived experience of mental distress and has received care from mental health professionals. A therapeutic relationship is, now we've seen this before on a, on a previous lecture, is a balance between personal self um, offering human closeness and professional distance. So that's a little bit tricky. So we're, we're, we're engaging with people as people, but we're not throwing ourselves into it as we might with a, um, a relationship outside of the workplace. And the idea is that we, it's an enabling relationship that supports the needs of the client. And, um, and that's that whole idea of being client focused. And for nurses in particular, I think, we usually take pride in our capacity to uh, develop rapport and establishing a connection um, with our, our uh, consumers, our patients, our clients, and, and developing trust. And trust has got to be a two-way street, of course. And, um, and I guess that's um, one of the things that, um, for those of us who are mental health nurses, really like that we get to connect with people. And, and it's one of those uh, things that that stuff around mutual trust and mutual respect that's kind of built into mental health nursing. A lot of us, certainly for me, feel that if I can't get rapport with my uh, with the person that I'm seeing, um, I'm not really sure what I've got to offer. Yeah. So that's uh, that's really full on. So we've got this partnership model, and we've got this idea about you know using ourselves in a in a therapeutic way and building rapport with somebody, and yet. Um, a lot of the patients, even in community mental health, aren't there because they want to be. They're under involuntary treatment orders. And you may recall from the lecture that you've had with Scott, um, uh, talking about the Mental Health Act, is, is that there are uh, involuntary treatment orders, not just for inpatient care, but also for community care. And, and I guess that, that can really put some pressure on, on us as individuals and, and professionals in trying to develop rapport with somebody who doesn't really see the need to actually have us involved in their life. It gets really a little bit tricky and, and often that, that building rapport um, takes a little bit of time and patience. But part and parcel of the Mental Health Act um, it kind of works out really well with the community, community mental health care because even if somebody we feel would be at risk to themselves or others if they didn't have um, assertive follow-up or assertive treatment, the Mental Health Act has it enshrined that um, that we only intervene if, the, if there's no less restrictive way. And so for a lot of people, the least restrictive way to provide the intervention that they need is to keep a close eye on them with them uh, at their home and support them to stay at home. They don't have to be schooled away like in ye olden days into an asylum. They, they can live a, a life that's connected with the community, or connected with the family. And that's a balancing act that we've got to do with, with, um, with making ourselves available to the patient and acknowledging that they sometimes would much rather not have us involved. And that's where I think around, um, for those of you who will go on placement with a community mental health team, um, that's where I think you'll probably find a lot of interest in seeing how nurses and, and, and I guess the other clinicians too uh, negotiate that. So what are the roles of the community mental health nurse? Look, just before I get stuck into that, I just need to um, um, point this out to you, just in case you weren't already aware. Just a tad over 1% of all midwives are, are male. I think it's 1.1 or 1.2%. For general nurses, it's a little bit over 10%, like 10.2, 10.4 or something percent of uh, nurses are males. But for mental health nurses, it's much higher. And I got in contact with the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses um, just yesterday and just to see if they had a figure that they're actually on holidays but they tweeted back to me that they're pretty sure it's 30 percent so it'll be so close to it that it doesn't matter they just couldn't give me the exact figure because they're on holidays but were good enough to tweet um, back to me so about 30 percent of, of all mental health nurses um, who in who are members of the College of Mental Health Nurses anyway are male um, yeah, anyway, so that's probably meaningless, but <laughs> it's interesting to me. The men mental health nurses, uh, I think this is probably part of the reason that, that there are um, 
more males in mental health nursing than in general nursing is is that we are very much part of the multidisciplinary team um, don't read anything into a position here I, 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 just because I put mental health nurses on top doesn't mean that we're really on top as much as I'd like to be um, but I, I think really it, most of the time it doesn't work like a hierarchy everybody's having input in there I think when when clinically when it comes to a tricky decision um, or something that's really contentious maybe then it, it turns into a little bit of a hierarchy everybody will have their say this is what I think should happen but they'll they'll defer to the consultant psychiatrist he or she's on the big money and so um, so um, and they do provide a clinical governance for us but not always leadership that leadership can be from anyone within the multidisciplinary team and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that in a, in a disparaging way at all. I think um, any member of the multidisciplinary team can, can take over leadership. But as long as we all have input and we all respect each other's skill sets. So anyway, I'll stop rambling and just get on with it. That On the multidisciplinary team, when you're on clinical placement, you're likely to come across social workers, occupational therapists, uh, mental health nurses, of course, psychologists and a psychiatric registrar, often you'll see that they're um, training, uh, working towards becoming a psychiatrist, so that's, uh, um, for most of them it takes five, six years to get through all their um, study and experience. And then the consultant psychiatrists who, um, yeah, who are, uh, are the specialties. And, and I think we could just as easily replace that, that middle component there that says multidisciplinary team, we'd just about, just as easily um, replace that with consumer we're all working together to provide for the, the consumer not all of us might have direct input into them but when we discuss uh, what's going on in our workplace and what's going on for our consumers um, usually it's a shared decision making uh, and and the whole multidisciplinary team will, will add in their aspect and that's the that's the real advantage I think is that social workers and OTs and, and psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health nurses um, can all look at things a slightly different way and we can uh, learn from each other Case management is a big part of the community mental health role and here's a definition for us by um, um, those people, those three of them. Case management is a delivery of care that coordinates and links various health care and social services to clients and their families who have complex health needs that involve ongoing care. Yeah, yeah, what does that really mean? Well, it's about participation in the consumer's environment and this, uh, this lady here, Helen Glover, she um, recently got a, a, a fairly uh, high um, award um, for her work um, working with consumers and, and she's very much about empowerment and and I guess what she's saying here is that is that we we the case managers are working in the consumers environment we're on their turf and we believe unconditionally in the person's ability to recover and work as if their recovery is reality even if sometimes we might be feeling a little uh, less optimistic about them you know coming good and, and, and perhaps resuming their, their complete previous level of uh, functioning but, but we need to stay involved and stay optimistic that's an important part for us. Yeah yeah what does it actually mean? What do we actually do? Well we do assessment and, and you've been exposed already to what a mental state assessment and a risk assessment and, and we've also done cognitive assessments so we do assessments, we do planning, stuff around goal setting, um, stuff uh, around um, you know, if, if the uh, consumer's goals are about getting back into work, what, what can we do to do that? And that's where that linking comes in. We link with other agencies. Um, we do a lot of monitoring and advocacy. So monitoring of, of um, I guess, how well they're going with their uh, mental state and, and, um, and if risk has been managed. But also advocating with the other agencies to make sure that they do get a fair go. And then we evaluate on are our interventions, are our um, uh, our interventions and our, and our plans and our links um, are they actually meeting the goals? Are we actually getting where we want to be? So there's a fair bit going on in that role. To do all of that and, um, and there's a fair bit that a community mental health nurse actually does. So um, start, starting off by establishing, building and maintaining those th therapeutic relationships with the consumers. And I mentioned before, that can be a little bit fraught, particularly, particularly if the consumers 
there as an involuntary patient that, that can take a little bit of doing. There's this uh, phrase that you might not have come across before, fatic chat. Um, and uh, it's worth googling if, uh, if you're interested. But fatic chat is that, that chat that we all do. Um, it can be about the weather, hi, how are you, all that sort of stuff. And it looks very conversational and it isn't really uh, goal directed. It's, it's, the, it's the oil that keeps the, the, um, uh, the wheels turning. I reckon, I reckon mental health nurses in particular are good at using fatted chat, this conversational tone and, and stuff, to actually do mental state assessments, to engage with the patient and get that therapeutic rapport, but also to find out what's going on. And there's some real advantage of, uh, advantages, I think, to using that, that casual conversational style. It, it, it's, it's not so clinical, it doesn't seem so... Uh, I, I, it doesn't seem so, I don't know, yucky. Uh, clinical is what I'm really trying to say. Um, but you can still get the work done. And I think sometimes when you're working with um, mental health nurses, it'll be interesting to see what looks like a conversation. Is there actually another purpose to it? And it'd be good to, you know, like if you've got a decent mentor that you're working with, um, to just check what their conversational style is about, what, what are they really getting from the patient and, um, and what purposes is it ser servicing. Uh, community mental health nurses um, offer administered uh, medications and we keep an eye on whether it's working and if there are any unwanted side effects. And that, that medication you know, can be oral or as you've practised in the OSCEs, um, sometimes uh, long-acting injections. Uh, we do do some supportive counselling and um, and some of us have got some training in in some of those therapies, cognitive behavioural therapy, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, that sort of thing. Um, a community mental health nurse um, plays a part in linking consumers with uh, different services and and social activities, and uh, and we mentioned some of those services earlier on, play that role in advocacy, um, assist them with lifestyle choices, and and we need to be a little bit cautious about that because in the end what we're doing is supporting the consumers' choices, um, but if we know that they're about to fall flat on their face, it'd be silly to withhold that information. You, you'd say, oh look. Remember the last time that you spent, um, I don't know, I'll just make it up as I go along, you, the last time you spent $100 on cigarettes at the beginning of your pay fortnight, um, you are out of food um, for that last um, four days. Let's not do that again. Can we, can we do something to, uh, other than um, uh, spend it all on cigarettes, that sort of stuff. Um, education, particularly around how uh, medications work and how systems work and, and, uh, and, and what the meaning of um, these symptoms are for for people, you know, like who have their own meaning, but we will be able to talk to them about what we think is uh, driving those symptoms, and keeping um, ourselves and and sometimes our consumers linked in with families and carers. Um, for somebody who's had a really uh, long-standing and serious mental health problem, sometimes they uh, their family and carers have. Um, uh, have burnt out a little bit and, um, and if we've got them going through a, a nice stable period of recovery that's a really good time to see if the family can be re-engaged and also we, we the clinicians, um, kind of need to hear from families and carers too because if they are engaged they might be seeing stuff that, that we're missing and that's really important to be, to be humble and, 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 and to know what we don't know. So Getting to the last bit now, which is uh, onto um, models of uh, community mental health care. Look, there's probably a thousand. Um, I'm just going to brush over three fairly quickly. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so first up is the recovery model, and this, the recovery model, is the one that's really has gained traction in 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 Australia and overseas in recent years. And and what people like about it is is that it gives that, that ownership of recovery um, back to the consumer. So they become self-empowered and, and they have that sense of being in control. And we hopefully assist them to maintain hope and we, and we want them to play a part of, of, of being a part in their recovery. We don't want them to be the passive victim to whatever it is, schizophrenia or depression or, or bipolar affective disorder. We, we want them to play a part in their recovery and, and that's good for them too. Um, 
Yeah, so the recovery model is recognised as the basis for empowering clients to or consumers to gain mastery over their lives and live with their mental health and acknowledge their limitations but recognising their ability to function in a satisfying, satisfying way. So even if I'm unable to shake off my symptoms entirely, even if every day in my life I'm going to experience some you know, like really irritating and, and uh, uncomfortable, um, say, auditory hallucinations or something, um, that doesn't mean that I don't still have values and hopes and dreams and I can't still have a quality of life. Let's not make it all about my symptoms. Let's, let's live by my values. That's where the recovery model kind of comes from. There's this really cool website. I, I know you guys get bombarded with readings and you might not get time for it now, but um, just to have a, uh, keep it in mind, it's geared up for consumers more that uh, we're not using it as a text, but it's called Secret Squirrel, Secret Squirrel Business. And, uh, and it's about um, uh, recovery in mental health. It's a really cool website, it's a, it's a really cool book, you can get the book for free I think, or, or it's, I know it's available in the Cairns Library, uh, and, and most of the, um, maybe even all the chapters are available online. It's really, really cool, and um, the reason I want to tell you about it isn't so you go through and read every word of it, you've got lots of reading to do outside of this. But maybe if you are working with um, consumers either on clinical placement or further down the track, and if they want to know a bit about recovery model, um, that would probably be a really good place to start. It's a, it's a nice website to look at and it's, uh, and it's well written. I guess for, for you and, and, and to hold in mind, and, and this would be the, you know, the sort of stuff that, you know, that those um, university lecturers like to include in exams and things is is the stuff that actually comes out of the core text and and I won't read out all of these things because I'm sure um, you're quite capable of reading them yourselves but in um, uh, Elder Evans and Nazette on pages 21 through to 25 there's um, a, a really nice little rundown of some of the essentials of recovery informed practice what we need to know about and that that stuff, I'll just go through a few of these just to make sense of it. That creating relationships of safety, that's very much a two-way street. That's about that, that mutual trust um, that we're talking about. Because the if the consumer is feeling really disempowered about us, they might not feel, even though we think we might be lovely nurturing people, they might feel that we're quite unsafe. They might have had the experience previously where um, you know, they've been held down by nurses and put into seclusion and, and for all we know if they get really disorganised again hopefully it won't but it could happen again but I guess what we want to do is, is engage with the person in a way to let them know this is where I'm coming from I'm here to support you if I can um, if I see that you're getting unwell is it okay if I let you know if I see that you're getting really agitated is it okay if I let you know how would I let you know get, get them to tell you and that feeds into the next one, encouraging the person to have a sense of control. This one here, and this is um, probably going to be come really natural, hopefully, for you as students, with engaging with curiosity, is because you can go in there as the naive inquirer. We don't have to be the expert in somebody else's life. They are. That's not our job. So we can... A big part of building trust is is to be curious about somebody, and there's a and there's a, there's a lovely paper written by a, a guy who's working in Cairns at the moment, uh, Richard Lakeman, and uh, and the paper was only uh, published a couple of months ago, so it was it was uh, too late for me to get it into the subject materials, but it was about. Um, I think being humble and not knowing and how valuable that is and how valued that is. It's a it's a wonderful paper. Um, those other things about ten, attending to the, the uh, consumer self-esteem and self-identity are really important. Um, that attending to language and meaning is, is about if they say something that you're not quite sure that you understand where they're coming from, just ask about it. Be that curious person, the naive inquirer, and, um, and tap into their capacity for self-knowing about what works and what doesn't. Um, those last two, I, I told you I wasn't going to read through this list, but here I am. I've just about finished, so I might as well. Um, facilitating self-help and, and personal responsibility. So that means not doing for, and, and maybe you, know, um, you, you might be able to learn from um, previous placements. You know, maybe if you've worked in aged care, you know, the idea there isn't to button up the pajamas 
or shirt for for every aged care resident. It's to take the time to help them button it up if they can. And I guess the similar sort of thing around mental health, that the easy thing might be, oh, you know, I don't know, I'll keep on using ridiculous examples, but, you know, give me your key card, I'll go down the bank for you. You wouldn't do that, by the way, that'd be horrific, what a bad example. Um, but, but really, you're much better off saying, oh, so what bus do we need to get on to get on, get to the bank? Help, help out in that way. Help, help them to 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 uh, stay in control of of their destiny as much as they can. And and then the, that last one is making sure that the external environments that facilitate recovery. And that's basically saying that um, I guess if somebody was um, I don't know in a share house where everybody was smoking twenty seven bombs every night, um, that might not be all that good for the recovery of somebody who's um, been experiencing uh, a psychotic illness that would be really quite bad. So that's all I'm going to say about the recovery model but um, but it's useful to know that that, uh, that chapter's in there um, in uh, Elder Evans and, and Nazette um, and around pages 21 to 25 in particular but that whole chapter's really worth reading. Um, the strengths model was about uh, the consumer strength, so it, it promotes a hopeful, holistic, recovery-orientated approach, and it focuses on the strengths, abilities, resources, and potential of the consumer. Um, and I think that's a, um, pretty self-explanatory. Hopefully, well, one of the things that I, I read actually on uh, the Secret Squirrel website was. Um, one of the consumers there saying, oh, for a long time I just thought I was my symptoms. It, it's taken me years to realise that I've got strengths as well. And I guess maybe what we want to do is if they are in a blind spot for the consumer to shine some light on them. Hey, you're really good at blah, blah, da, da. And then the last one uh, that I'm going to talk about is uh, psychosocial rehab. And the goal of psychosocial rehab is to facilitate and support people with mental illness to live, learn, work, play, and relate to others within their community. So keeping them nice and connected, it's collaboration and partnership with clients are the important uh, principles of uh, psychosocial rehab. And I just want to give a quick little comparison here, just to put your head around it. So Soko Social Rehab focuses on wellness and health, um, where some of the criticisms that, that's made around the medical model is that it talks about disease, disorder and illnesses. We're all looking for symptoms there. And, and the psychosocial rehab model says, yeah, 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 we know the symptoms, but what keeps them well? What, what are the good bits? Um, we want to know about their abilities rather than their disabilities. We want to keep them in a, in a nice uh, familiar setting at home rather than squirreled away in an institution. We want to have a relationship which is adult to adult, which means, and like, let's get used to this, is that people might disagree with us from time to time, as other adults will, whereas in the medical model, or the hierarchical kind of model, it will be like, I'm the expert and you're the patient, I'll make the decisions here. And the decision making, uh, rather than being the expert who tells you what's going on, it, those decisions are made in partnership. So look, we've covered a fair bit of ground in a shorter amount of time. I, um, I hope that that makes sense. I, I think it's important, this is the say what question which pops up over and over again. I think it's important because um, uh, we all are all going to be going on uh, clinical placement or, or PEP. and. Um, and many of us will be going uh, into the community and it's good to get a bit of an understanding about what that is so we can all be good enough nurses when we're out there and uh, and have a pretty good understanding of what's going on in, in community mental health care. That's the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching. <laughs>